arrangement. As the time moves forward, we think by doing it after Isha, this talk, I mean doing, <laughs> giving the talk after Isha, it's getting a bit too late. So uh, with consultation with the speakers, uh, we said probably we can do it after Maghrib. Just have Maghrib, we finish it after Isha, everybody pray Isha, and then we can all go home and ready for Monday, Inshallah. Yes, start from yes. next week inshallah. after Maghrib, Inshallah. Yes, In Alhamdulillah, Nahmuduhu, when I stay in Hope, when I stop her, when I would be laying in Shururi and Fosina, women say at Amalina, may Yahni Allah, Fala Mudilla, or may you live Fala Hadiella, or shadow and la ilaha illa law who are the whole Ashari Kala, or shadow and Mohammed and Abduhu or Sulu and Mabad, Assalamu alaikum to Allahi, or Barakatu. Topic today uh, is. Uh, how was it exactly? Politics and its greater good. Uh, politics and the greater good. Politics and the greater good. Um, obviously, since Islam, uh, we believe, is Kamil Shamil, is all inclusive of uh, the human situation and, the hu and our human affairs uh, involve our personal spiritual growth. Tazkirtu uh, Nafs. Our human affairs involve uh, family life and uh, immediate social life. Uh, human affairs involve the life of the nation or the wider community, which we can call or which we quite often call politics. And human life involves nations interacting with other nations. International, international affairs, which still comes under the rubric or the umbrella of politics. So <clears throat> actually, uh, it's very difficult <clears throat> to live a righteous life, a, in the sense of Islam and being a Muslim, without indulging in something of politics. So in that sense, and that sense alone, all Muslims by definition, are political in nature. However, the word politics is not an Islamic word or a Quranic word, and the word politics is very much dominated by what we understand to be the politics of the world today, whether the politics that happen over in Parliament or the politics of the European Union or the politics of the United Nations. Generally, it's that type of politics which we associate rightly or wrongly, or rightly and wrongly, in fact, in our minds, with that type of Machiavellian politics. You can never get a straight answer from a politician. They're always ducking and diving. The daggers are drawn behind your back. You don't know what's going on uh, when the curtains are, are drawn, kind of politics. And so when we talk about Muslims being involved politically or having political uh, engagement, uh, we need to kind of first understand what it means or what politics means in the Muslim or rather in the Islamic context. So let's start with a definition first. Anyone know the, uh, the Islamic term for politics? Siyasa or siyasat in Urdu. Siyasa. And does anyone know this term siyasa, uh, where it originates from in the Arabic language, what it's related to? From the horse. Mashallah, you remember well, brother Zahid. Barakallah feekum. They say, the Arabs say, do you remember it? Sasul Amr. And the, the, the Sasul Amr, uh, Sasul Amr means to take care of an affair. And in the olden days, uh, someone who would look after a thoroughbred horse, an Arabian stallion, which was a very prized possession, or any other horse for that matter, especially if it was a racehorse, grooming it, uh, breeding it, nurturing it, would be called a sa'is. A sa'is. Someone who is looking after something. In this case, 
it was a thoroughbred horse. And the Sa'is, from where we get the word Siyasa, is someone who is doing Sa'sul Amr. He's looking after the affair of something very carefully uh, and very thoroughly. And then the idea of a human being looking after the affairs of the wider community, okay, of the nation, to use a more modern phrase, of the ummah, then that became siyasa. Siyasa means to take care, in the, in the religious sense now, siyasa means to take care of the affairs of the Muslim collective or ummah. Siyasa means to take care and be concerned with the affairs of the Muslims collectively. <coughs> and if we bear in mind the idea of Sa'is grooming a horse, really, actually, all of us could pat a horse and stroke it, but really looking after a horse, especially if it is a very prized horse, it requires not only effort, dedication and patience, it actually requires uh, some knowledge, it requires ilm, okay, you can't just give anybody a brush in, the house, uh, in, their, uh, in their hand and um, I don't know, a bucket of oats, that's how much I know about horses, right, a bucket of oats or whatever they, the horses eat and say, you know, bismillah, because yeah, they will get so far, but not really quite how the horse should be maintained. <clears throat> in that sense, there was an understanding that siyasa which I'll now call siyasa shari'a, Islamic politics, politics related to the sacred law or the Islamic teachings. Siyasa to shari'a, Islamic politics, requires knowledge as well as other traits. And it was traditionally associated, who was siyasa really associated with you and me? With the baker, with the farmer, who was the siyasa normally associated with? Whose job was it to be a sa'is over the ummah? The caliph, the khalifa, the amirul mu'mineen. That single head of state that we had, uh, not for most part of our ummah, for, uh, for a short part of our ummah, for about, say around about 150 to 200 years, where you can say clearly there was one single head of state, a, a, a Khalifa or an Amir al Mu'mineen or a Sultan, uh, which not only did he have the crown on his head, so to speak, but he actually had the political power over uh, the then given lands of the Muslims. By the time Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal was alive, that's in the kind of middle of the Abbasid, uh, the Abbasid period, uh, he was born in the year 164 Hijrah and he dies in the year 241 Hijrah. During that, around about that period somewhere, we find that the Abbasid Caliph loses a lot of his political power to rival, uh, to rival claims. And he becomes the Caliph after Harun al-Rashid and a few others. He, uh, uh, not, not after Harun, uh, after uh, Al-Mu'tasim and, uh, and these people. He becomes a titular head of state, rather like the Queen of England. The Queen of England is the sovereign of the land. Okay, uh, Jubilee is coming up, and we're going to have a street party, and we're going to do all sorts of things, inshallah, with samosas, and whatever, and we're going to, maybe, we'll do a street party, and we'll make it the best, and we'll, it'll be a way for doing dawah, who knows, anyway. She is the head of state, but you and I know that political power doesn't lie in her hand anymore. In the, day, in the days of Oliver Cromwell and the uh, uh, destruction of the monarchy, because we've always had a monarchy in this country, except for that short, you know, I can't remember, 10-year period or less than 10-year period in which Cromwell uh, 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 abolished monarchy and the, and the country becomes a republic, uh, but it was worse off uh, in terms of tyranny than it was with the, with the previous king. And so they reinstated uh, sovereignty and kingship, and we've, ever, we've had that ever since. Um, but Parliament drew most of the powers away from the king or the queen because the king or the queen were using the, the army and the taxes of the land for their own whims and desires. When they weren't popular, they thought, oh, okay, let's, let's have a war with France. That always goes down well, well with the English. 
and then thousands of thousands of pounds or whatever will be taken from the, you know, the taxes of the people and the poor just for this kind of ego trip. And many other things were happening. The rule of law was arbitrary. And so Parliament, and even before that, going back to the Magna Carta, Parliament said, hold on a minute, we need to take power away from you and we need to restrict your power so that you don't put the country in jeopardy in various ways. And that's more or less the beginning of uh, Parliament having power. And in our time, uh, and at once, so once upon a time, the Parliament was just the House of Lords. Across the land, there were lords, rulers of certain areas, certain parishes and provinces. And beneath them would be the, the normal workers like you and me. They would be the, the lords would be land owning and you know, um, palace owning and whatever other uh, property they had. And you and me would probably be working off the land, hiring it or whatever. And what would happen is these lords would meet regularly uh, with the king uh, sitting in, you know, in, uh, um, uh, at the top. And the lords would take our complaints. Oh, what about this? What about that? The, the taxes are too strong this year. We're not having a good harvest, so on and so forth. And then they would discuss these things and try to sort them out in some way. I mean, I'm, I'm making it sound rosy-dosy. It's not always rosy, but the process is good. Then what happens after a little while, more and more common people like us have more and more grievances. We need to interact more and more with the Lord. So they said, look, you know, we can't remember everything that the common people are telling us in my little, par little parish or estate. So you, you will be the leader of the common people. You come to parliament when parliament literally means discussion or to speak from you know, the French to parley is to discuss or to talk. And so what it was was political talk of how to govern the country with those who had wealth, power, and might, starting with the king. Then, so the lords who were assembled there, and it was then called the House of Lords, okay? The House of Lords said, we need common people here now so that they can... Uh, they can represent the common people of the land. So you had all these commoners, and they would come and sit in on some part of the meeting or say their piece. After a little while, it was understood that there is parliament would be house of lords where the power lay, and there'll be the house of commons. But slowly and steadily, after hundreds and hundreds of years, the balance of power shifts for various reasons, which we won't go into, such that by our time now, the House of Commons is the power base, is where legislation is done. And the House of Lords is where you want to take a nap on really expensive furniture. <laughs> MashaAllah. Anyway, point being is, um, the, 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 the nature of, uh, of, of politics, if we can kind of understand that, at least about this country, uh, the nature of, uh, of politics is such that there is a kind of dialogue. Let me, let me come back to the point. Sasul Amr. So really... The, uh, and the point was, the Queen now is the head of state, but she has no power. Parliament has all power. By the time of Imam Ahmed, there were about three or four political authorities in the Muslim land, each having their own army and power. But they all said, the Abbasid Caliph will make him the titular head of state, meaning you stay there with a crown on your head, so to speak. Uh, but in the end, we control our own country. And uh, there were, uh, and the scholars just had to deal with it. They just literally had to deal with the reality that there was more than one head of state uh, by the time of Imam Ahmed. And it kind of never got back together. By the end of the glory days of Islam, we had three caliphates. The Ottoman caliphate, which ruled most of the Muslim world. The Mughal, it wasn't a caliphate, but the Mughal Empire, the Mughal Empire which it had its own sultanate, sultanate in uh, India. And we had, anybody know the last one? Turkey. Not the, the, the Ottomans were the Turks. The Fatimids, the Shia Fatimid Caliph, and they had quite a stronghold. By, that's by the 15th century of the Common Era. By the 16th century, more or less, it's you know, declining. By the 17th and 18th century, nearly everything is gone, apart from the very fragile Ottoman Caliphate. Nevertheless, it was understood that the head of state has power. Why uh, uh, does the siyasa? Why? Because in order to look at the affair, you need to be at the top of the pyramid to know what is best. That's how traditionally it was. Okay, so that's one thing. 
Siyasa in Islam is taking care of the affairs of the Ummah. So what are the affairs of the Ummah? Let me ask you a question. A Muslim woman over there in some part of the world who is struggling to get clean water to drink, is that part of the affairs of the Ummah or not? Yes. yes. Over in that part of the world, there are tens or thousands of Muslims dying from diseases. Is that part of the affairs of the Ummah or not? Yes. Over in that part of the Ummah, an enemy army has come into the land of the Muslims and is harming them uh, in some form or fashion. Is that affairs of the Ummah or not? Yes. Over there, there are some Muslims who, they are so poor and ignorant, they have no copies of the Qur'an and they can't even read Alif Ba Ta Sa Tha. Is that part of the affairs of the Ummah or not? Yeah. You can then imagine, okay, how many affairs of the Ummah there actually are. Everything, more or less, is the affairs of the Ummah. Now, does that mean that we have to be involved, poke our nose in everybody's business? Well, the scholars of Islam will say, or t uh, say that actually Islam, the affairs of the Ummah, can be summed up in one scholarly sentence. They say the whole of Islam is about darul mafasid wa jalbul masalih. Darul mafasid Wajalbul Masaleh, warding off harm and procuring benefits, getting benefits, warding off harm and procuring benefits, that's the whole of Islam. <coughs> Whether this harm is spiritual, physical, economic, uh, psychological, military, whether the benefit is the same, warding off harm and bringing benefits really is a summary of the whole of Islam. But that is quite vague. So you take this, this, uh, this Darul Mafasid wa Jalbul Masale concept, warding off harm and procuring benefit, and you kind of put it through a prison and it splits up into prism and it splits up into clearer parts. They say there are six things, or five or six things, that really the whole of the Islamic teachings comes to protect and keep safe. And really the whole of politics then comes to protect and keep these five or six things safe. And these five or six things are known as maqasid al-sharia, the objectives or the goals of the Islamic law or the sacred law. Anybody know them? Apart from Dr. Salim, he doesn't count. We will ignore him. <laughs> okay, hifzud din, protecting religion and faith, is the is one of them. Actually, it's the first one. Hifzul man. Protecting wealth and property. Hifdun nafs, protecting physical self. Uh, protecting lineage is the fourth one, nasab. Hifdul uh, ird, protecting honor and sanctity. And I've left, left one more out. Hifdul aql, protecting intellect. So, for example, we're not allowed to drink because drinking destroys intellect. And then it creates havoc and destroys property as well. Okay, as anyone witnesses on a Friday night. Okay, and maybe if it's just pub property, fine, but it tends not to be. Um, for example, uh, Hifzud Deen is why traditionally Muslims have had the execution for apostasy. And there is some kind of discussion about what are the full conditions about this apostasy. Is it a public apostasy? Is it a private apostasy? But man baddala deenahu faqtaluhu, whoever changes his religion then executes him, which is the order of the... Uh, come, uh, the duty of a head of state, there's that kind of idea to protect religion. Protecting uh, uh, honor, I'm not allowed to backbite, lie or slander. It's a, a major sin. And if the caliph wanted, or if the judge wanted, he could interfere and punish me, God forbid, even though there's not a specific punishment in Islam, but it will be to the discretion, discretion of the ruler in order to protect honor. And you can in, imagine if honor isn't protected, fair game to anyone and you couldn't trust anybody and the whole of society will break down once trust diminishes. Uh, likewise, uh, protecting wealth, one, that's why stealing is haram. So these six things, five or six things, were protected by the Sharia. Why? Because these are the, go these are the goals that the Sharia comes to protect. So a politics is very much about protecting these five or six things, these maqasid or Sharia, okay, for Muslim societies and Muslims. Okay? 
So automatically it tells you this is not the affair of some young blood who wants to do, you know, who feels passionate about something. And politics is not in Islam just about cursing or swearing. And it might not even uh, against the ruler. And I, I suggest to you it might not even be that at all. But certainly it's not just that. And certainly it's not just sitting there on your armchair having a go at the greater powers to be of your time. <coughs> okay? It's taking care, protecting and taking care of the affairs of the ummah. Whoever hasn't given their zakat has, is instrumental in not taking care of the affairs of the ummah. Anything else they say out of their mouth is cheap talk and or hypocrisy, God forbid. Why? Because zakat is instrumental in helping certain categories of needy Muslims, sometimes just to survive. Whoever doesn't give much charity, then to the degree that we don't give charity in a time in which there is great need, is the degree that we actually are not engaged in taking care of the affairs of the ummah. To the degree we don't make dua, to the degree that we're not careful about our youths, and I'm not talking about some right, self-righteous attitude of a parent, ah, oh, look at these young people, they don't know anything. And, yeah, and I was young myself, and I would like to think that I'm young now, but not in that sense. <laughs> but in the concerned way, that, oh, you know what? I know how it feel to, felt to be a youth in my time with all the temptations. It's just become a thousand times harder now. And you have that kind of empathy with the youths in their struggles, day-to-day -day struggles, at least of which is trying to get them into the, into the masjid, you know, or to just... If not be, be in the masjid, then at least not be somewhere which is disastrous. So all of this, actually, we can all be uh, uh, involved in the affairs of the ummah. So those two things. First and foremost, it's sasul amr, going back to grooming and nurturing and taking care of. Secondly, it's about jalbul masalih, darul mafasid wa jalbul masalih, procuring benefits, warding off harms. And thirdly, breaking it down, it's protecting these six things, faith, wealth, honor, lineage, uh, reputation, uh, intellect, so on and so forth. Let's bring it to actual issues and events. In the affair of politics, and I now use the word politics not just in the Islamic sense, but as we understand it just as an English word. Politics generally is the arena or the area of ijtihad. The fourth point, for my fourth point is, Politics is generally the arena of ijtihad, meaning of, uh, of uh, well, ijtihad is scholarly, uh, an, a, a scholarly attempt to understand the situation and to put the right ruling, bring the right ruling or the right fatwa to it. Why? Because politics involves human beings, and it doesn't involve one or two, it involves loads of human beings. And even if you have two human beings in a marriage, for example, you, can, you know how complex the relationship could be. You throw in a few children, and then the family unit becomes five, four or five members, and it becomes even more complex. You amplify that to include the whole ummah, thousands and thousands and thousands of families and individuals, you can understand the complexity is incredible. And what happens is, just like, for example, if I were to ask any of you, look, there is a brother and sister. They've been married two years, and they've got two children, and a third is on the way. And the husband, let's just say, is beating the wife, not viciously, but beating her. Should we tell the sister to get a divorce or not? Who in there, who right now could be confident to say, yes, I would, I would give them the, uh, the, 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 the fatwa advice what to do? Is there, first and foremost, is there one, one solution to this problem? Or are there more than one solution? More than one. The extreme solutions are obvious. Either get divorced, right, and that way you won't be beaten by your husband. But then what do you do with children? And the one, you know, uh, leaving the one you're carrying, okay, because that complicates the issue of divorce. Or you can say, well, keep with the children, but then what about the, the physical well-being of the sister, of, of the woman? So it's very difficult. You have to then balance. Then you have to look at the individuals. You have to see, well, hold on. What is the best? And sometimes it's not kind of clear. 
Imagine that for one family, then imagine that for the Ummah with all of its problems. Then you can tell this is not an area where you can just bring out one hadith or one verse and say, you know, there you are, you're going against the Quran, you're going against Islam. You know, hukum bighayri ma anzal Allah or something like this. You're judging by other than the judgment of God. And therefore, no, it, this requires depth. That's why traditionally, unless you're married and you've got children and you have a level of engagement in social affairs, don't speak, zip up. <laughs> okay, the best thing you could do for the ummah is zip up. Because anything, anything you have to say, unless you're a budding saint, is irrelevant. You can't, if you haven't learned to look after family, you're unlikely to be able to give any wise declarations and pronouncements of how to look after a community. There are exceptions to that, of course, but generally that's a rule of thumb. And at once upon a time, Muslims had no pretensions, no false uh, pretenses about themselves that, yes, I am a man of wisdom, and yet I'm <laughs> only 25 or 28 or... 30. 30 is getting there, you know, you can feel something is happening, but not much really, still not much. Really, life begins at 40. Okay, the only thing is about modern life, by the time you get to 40, you're kind of out of touch with the youth. Because <laughs> they're on a different path. 1950s onwards ensure that the youths have a different tra tra trajectory, and so it becomes very difficult to, to keep up with who they are and what they are, so you do need specialisation. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to bring traditional outline so that we understand how this thing is going uh, and then we just have to kind of bang it and hammer it and shape it to, to uh, modern situations but we need the, the, the qawaid, the principles okay, the principles, we won't say qawaid in the singular because that would get us all in trouble <laughs> okay, we need the principles uh, to understand so these are the first four principles but now let me just give you one or two uh, examples in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Oh, just going back to that thing of ijtihad. When it's an ijtihad, and, uh, I, I, um, and let's say the judge or the ruler or the scholar, depending, is doing their learned best to look at the situation and do the right thing or say the right thing or give the right fatwa in that situation. And we're assuming intentions are good. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, إِذَا حَقَمَ الْحَاكِمْ فَاجْتَهَدَ فَأَصَابَ if a judge strives to give a judgment and makes ijtihad, does this deduction, and he is correct, he gets two rewards. If he gets it wrong, if he errs, then he gets a single reward. There is no mention of sin, because in both cases, right or wrong, there is no sin. As long as the person is qualified and has done their best, utmost best, given their knowledge and situation, to arrive at the ruling. Okay? As long as they're qualified. So if someone comes along who is not a scholar, and not from the Ahlul Ifta, not from the people who can give fatwa, and gives a fatwa, even if he's right, he is sinful. The Prophet said, in a hadith in the Sunnah of Abu Dawud, there is some kind of uh, discussion about his... The, the chain of uh, authenticity, but its meaning is without doubt clearly sound. That whoever interprets the Quran, even if he is correct, let him take his seat in the fire of hell. Okay? Even if he's correct. Why? Because if he is not qualified, it's irrelevant whether he's right or wrong. He's done something haram from the beginning. And the one who is qualified, then even if he is wrong, he will never be sinful. He will just be wrong. Okay? That kind of gives us a very kind of, be careful in treading in people's shoes. You know, they say, don't be a back, back seat driver. Okay. Uh, and I actually don't drive. Okay. So, you know, I, can ha I, can't, I tend to have that, uh, that nature of being a back seat driver sometimes. Okay. Uh, it's not that I can't, uh, you know, can't drive, but I'm, you know, I've never taken a test and therefore I'm not passing, whatever. This idea of being a backseat driver, many of us unfortunately are backseat drivers. We're kind of telling our parents, who have learned maybe through experience, <coughs> certain things that really they know through experience that we have no clue with because we're only 20, 30. And when we're with children and that much, we'll understand how it is. And that's why sometimes as parents, I mean, my dad did that with me. He's like, yeah, inshallah. 
he is like, I thought it was a serious issue. And my dad thinks it was quite trivial. And I'm thinking, okay, well, but I had a good relationship with my dad, so I didn't kind of mock him. But, you know, it, it, it's a kind of a, uh, the door opening for sons or, you know, children to mock their parents. Oh, what do they know? But now, you know, year, decades later, I'm looking at, mashallah, I'm so glad he took that way. I'm so glad that was said. I'm so glad. Because you see, you see it for what it really is. You see it through the, through the eyes of some kind of maturity, inshallah, not through youthful uh, naivety. So we at least let us all try, including myself, to know who we are and where we are, to know our state, to know our state. And I, I, I imagine and I think three quarters of our problems is because we don't know our state. That's one thing. Second thing is, let's look at some pros and cons in the life of the Prophet and then uh, we'll open it up, inshallah. There's this article that I wrote called Weighing the Affairs in a now defunct magazine called Alibana. This is 1996, so 16 years ago. And I picked it up now again today. I thought, oh, this is a bit useful. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Um, a few hadiths. Bukhari. Khabab ibn al-Arrat radilanhu says, we complain to the Prophet وسلم, about the persecutions, you know, the persecutions in Makkah that the Muslims were getting. And whilst the Prophet وسلم, was sitting under the sh in the shade of the Kaaba, leaning upon his cloak, we, sit we said to him, well, will you not seek help for us? And I don't need to tell you the dire situation of the Muslims in the Makkan period and the persecution going on then. Will you not seek help for, uh, for us? Will you not make dua to Allah for us? So this is what the Prophet sallallahu said. There, were, there was amongst those before you a believing man who would have a hole dug for him and he would be placed in it. Then a saw would be brought and placed upon his head and he would be sawn in half. Yet that would not make him abandon his religion. His body would be torn and raked with an iron comb and the flesh from his bones and his nerves were removed. Yet that did not make him give up his religion. By Allah... This religion will prevail until a rider will travel from Sana'a to Hadramaut, not fearing anything except Allah and the wolves with regards to his sheep. But you people are impatient. Now, kind of outwardly, if we didn't know that's the Prophet's lesson, you'd think, oh, that's not very helpful. That's how we would think, the kind of untutored mind, irreligious mind. Oh, that's not really helpful. He could call upon Allah. Allah uh, always listens to du'as of prophets, and he doesn't. And then on top of that, we're being, لَوَلَاكِنَّكُمْ تَسْتَعْجِلُونَ Your people are in a hurry. He didn't say it like that, Salasa, but you people are in a hurry. But subhanAllah, look at this. Look at the teachings, look at the attitude. There's something that needs to be cultivated because the affair of the believer is not just a material affair. The affair of the believer is ultimately a spiritual affair, but we have to live in the material world. So we have to deal with a lot of material and worldly and political activities. But they are, important as they are, they are part of our spiritual journey. And spiritual journey requires not being hasty, especially when it comes to large numbers of people. Okay, that's one thing. Another thing, let me just read you from the Aqeedah of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, mainstream Sunni Islam. This is Aqeedah Tahawiyah. Uh, this is a point of consensus, and there is only one aspect of it that has some small differences by a small set of scholars. Um, we Let's see how they translated this. We do not recognize khuruj, rebelling, against our heads of state and those whom they deputize in authority, even if they are jar, even if they are tyrannical or unjust, or rather unjust. Nor do we, nor do we uh, make dua against them, nor do we pray against them, and nor do we remove our hand from obedience 
And we believe that obedience to them is obedience to Allah and it's an obligation as long as they do not command us to do something sinful. We pray for their rectification and their well-being. And that's why Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal uh, was once asked, if you had a dua that you know, knew would be definitely responded to by Allah, what, what dua would you make? He said, I would make dua for the ruler. And they said, how comes? He said, because if the ruler is upright, the land will be upright. And if the ruler is crooked, the land will be crooked. That was in an age in which rulers, kings and whatever, had a great influence over the land. Before the modern age of individualism, where we don't care what the ruler is doing, we're more interested in what's going on in the house, get me out of their kind of house, or what's happening on Britain's Got Talent, or something like that. Okay? But you can understand that for a lot of people, that's still the, still the case. I remember in the 1980s when I, when, I, when I first went to Saudi Arabia and I had an uncle who, who lives there uh, I, and, um, and he was saying to his wife, oh, can you get me this and can you get me that? Very nice chap, mashallah. Uh, and he was like, can you get me this, can you get me that? And he was really in, uh, eager to get this kind of dress, this particular thol. And what had happened is because uh, one, of the, one of the king was on the news in the 80s and he came out and he seemed to be wearing this new type of thobe, fashionable thobe. And so, uncle being quite, that my uncle being quite rich, uh, he thought, you know, I'll have a bit of that as well. And actually, people of that kind of stature actually modeled, modeled themselves at that time, okay, on royalty. And that happened even here and happens, you know, and that's understandable. Point being is, that's how it is with rulers. So therefore... Not rebelling against Muslim rulers, even if they're tyrannical. There is a consensus on this. There is an ijma on this. The only people who ever went against it were a deviant group called the Khawarij. Well, they weren't the only people, but they were the main people. So now, when it comes to, say, in the, the Arab Springs, the Arab uprisings, is that going against? Is that not going against? What is it? Well, to some, pe to some scholars, it's clear. To some scholars, they will say, actually, this person, unfortunately, isn't actually a Muslim ruling us. So the rule doesn't apply. And some people will say, well, no, I think he's a Muslim. Just very terrible Muslim, but Muslim nonetheless. Rule does apply. Then some scholars will come along and say, well, actually, what in Jar, even if he's uh, unjust, his injustice has transgressed the bounds to mass murder, which doesn't come under the prohibition. You know, uh, taking people's wealth, locking up a few people, a few hundred people here and there, having a secret police that everyone's scared of at night. I mean, that's bad, and you're living on, you know, on eggshells. Different than just going out with your army and volley, volleying missiles and anything at civilians for whatever reason. So some people say, well, actually, rebelling... With that, doesn't count. And some people say, yes, it, uh, it's still not, rebellion is still not allowed. And then, therefore, you'll find rightly guided scholars, and of course, there is no doubt, scholars are human beings. I mean, it's hope that they're, they're, they're slightly better than us, in, you know, at least in integrity of knowledge and practice. But they are human beings, and human beings are tempted. And that's why, historically, we've had three types of scholars. We've always had three types of scholars. But the Ummah only knows two types. There are three types, but the Ummah only knows two types and has confused one of their types. Three types. There is Ulama al-Dawla, government scholars. There are Ulama al-Ummah, which literally translate as scholars of the Ummah, but I'll call it popular scholars. And there is Ulama al-Milla, scholars of the religion. What's the difference? Ulama al-Dawla, their intention, their intention and purpose is to prop up the government by hook or by crook, through fatwas. Perhaps they get a good salary. Perhaps they like the position. Worldliness has opened. And we've had that since almost the beginning of times. Not many scholars, but as time grew on and wealth increased, it became a huge temptation. Your scholarly knowledge was a ladder to a career advancement of material prosperity. We can understand that because we're all tempted at some level. Ulama <laughs> Adola. Not that their fatwas agree with the government. Their fatwas are purposely there for the government. 
Then there is ulama al um So they're not really the scholars we should be looking to. Then there is ulama al um We'll call it populist scholars. Their intention is not God. Their intention is to please the masses. Because the masses are the reckless herd. And that's what Chomsky calls them, right? Okay, we have uh, Islamic terms are even worse. Okay, if Chomsky in his, uh, <laughs> in his niceness says that the masses are the reckless herd, in Islam they're ghawgha and ra'a. They're the riffraff and the scum. Why? Because they don't have that spiritual maturity or that knowledge or that patience or that integrity. And there are a few individuals, they're just like, whoa, balls in a pen. When some big noise is made, it just burst out in every direction without any thought. And by and large, masses, whether in the east or the west, are always on the Illa man rahim That's human nature. Okay, which is why, going back to political philosophy, uh, why uh, the Enlightenment thinkers, Thomas Hobbes and Thomas Paine uh, and uh, people like that, uh, and John Locke, talked about a social contract. That in the absence of state authority, in the absence of, which we call anarchy, folder, no one can do anything. You can't even live a religious life because you don't know who can come into your house to shoot you. And that's why Imam Ibn Taymiyyah says, it has been said, 60 years of unjust rule is better than one day of anarchy. And the idea behind rebellion was, that normally when rebe rebellion happens, civil war ensues because normally most societies have groups and, groups and factions in them. And once civil war starts, you can't put the lid back on it. Pandora's box is open. And once the structures of law and order break down, it can break down in one day and it could take 10 years to put back together. And in that time, if you have other countries waiting in the wings with agendas, then by the time the lid is put back onto security, you'll find that all your wealth and everything is siphoned off. And all these contracts have been made without you knowing. That kind of makes you enslaved. Sounds familiar, yeah? Well, it happens. It happens. Okay. God save the queen. And so it's always been, subhanAllah, is that the way we're supposed to look at things? So let's look at one more, one more uh, hadith. Uh, two more. One is a narration. A group of Muslims came to Hassan al-Basri. Hassan al-Basri is one of the imams of the second generation Muslims. And they sought a fatwa from him regarding Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. I mean, if you take any one of these shabby <coughs> tyrants today in the Muslim world, barring the fact that they have modern technology, <coughs> None of them are as cruel as Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. God knows best. If Hajjaj was here today, he'd make these shabby tyrants that we've had over the Muslim world and we still have over some parts of the Muslim world, they, he'd make them look like pussycats. Really. He was that vicious. He was that cruel. <coughs> he had a hand, directly or indirectly, in the death of Abdullah ibn Umar. He, had a, he, he was known to have killed Sa'id ibn Jubayr, one of the imams of the Tabi'un. And Al-Hassan al-Basri, this fearless, God-fearing scholar, actually said, recited one of the ayats which make you invisible when Hajjaj came knocking on his door. But you know what? I'd rather not kind of encounter him. Uh, Abdullah ibn Zubair. Uh, uh, sorry, he, he had a hand in the killing of Abdullah ibn Zubair. And so they came to him, these youths, uh, give us a fatwa so we can rebel against Hajjaj. Because, and they said, because Hajjaj, he spilt our blood, he's taken our wealth, he does this, and he does, and, he, and they were right. They were right in all that they said. So, they said, oh Abu Sayyid, oh Hassan al-Basri, what do you say about fighting against this oppressor who has unlawfully spilt blood and unlawfully taken wealth and did this and did that? So Hassan al-Basri said, I don't see that we should fight him or make khuruj, rebel against him. Listen to this, because if this is a punishment from Allah, then we, you will not be, be able to remove Allah's punishment with your sword. But if this is a trial from Allah, a test from Allah, then be patient until Allah's judgment came, comes. And Allah is the best of judges. So these youths, they left Hassan al-Basri rather unimpressed. And I, I wonder, you know, what was going on. I mean, I don't know. The narrations doesn't say so, but, you know, they're youths and 
you know, if they had the language that we had today, they probably some of them probably were saying, "Oh, government scholar, wishy washy, just knows books and what a set out." Uh, 101 other uh, descriptions, you know, as self righteous youths do. Okay, um, and so they left Hassan al Basri and disagreed with him, and they re rebelled against Hajjaj, and Hajjaj slaughtered all of them. Hajjaj killed all of them. And then news in later days reached Hassan al-Basri about this. They're rebelling and Hajjaj is slaughtering. And this is what he said. If only the people, had, if only the people when they were being tus tested by their unjust rulers, would have patience, it would not be long before Allah would give them a way out. However, they rush for their swords, so they are left to their swords. Wallahi, by Allah, not for even a single day, did these youths bring about any good? Okay. How does he see it? He sees that Hajjaj is uh, not righteous. And there is some disagreement between the scholars of that time whether he was even a Muslim or not. But the majority opinion, he's a, a Muslim but a wicked, tyrannical Muslim. And Hassan al-Basri was definitely of that view, wicked, tyrannical Muslim. So he had no love for Hajjaj in that sense. But why is he saying it about the youths? Because what these youths did, let's just say there were ten of them. Then they go and canvas another 10. And they canvas another 10. And they canvas another 10. And then you get 100 Jews going out, get slaughtered, obviously, because the state and the army. And what happens to the ruler? The ruler then becomes 10 times worse. Now, even if you kind of wink, yeah, this guy's going to get me. When I, was, when I entered into practice in Islam, back in, uh, when was Khalid al-Islam Bali's assassination of Sadat? Was that 79? 77, 79? Anybody? About 79. 79. It, um, thereabouts, I came in uh, to religious consciousness. I was always a Muslim, mashallah, but into religious consciousness back in those, those days, at least on the news. Uh, there were a couple of things. There was the Iranian Revolution. There was the uh, Russian invasion of Afghanistan. Um, round about that time, before or after somewhere, is uh, Anwar Sadat, who, who at Camp David signed the peace accord between the state of Israel and Egypt, which incensed a lot of the Muslim world. Uh, in the end, some people, some Muslims, right, uh, religiously practicing Muslims, shot him. Actually, it was on TV during a state march by. And we actually watched that on the news. And it's like, whoa. And um, I was, I, I didn't even know what hadith was. I once read a hadith, and, uh, and it was my first time reading a hadith. And someone said, um, <laughs> subhanAllah, we read this hadith in this 40 hadith of Imam Nawawi book, okay, which is very famous. And at the end, it said, Related by Muslim. Now I know it's Sahih Muslim now. In my mind I was thinking, well of course it's related by a Muslim. A Hindu is not going to relate the words of the Prophet. <laughs> right? That's how much I knew about Islam. Okay? I, I could barely remember the pillars. Okay? Anyway, uh, so we thought, the use of our, we thought it was fantastic. Sadat and whatever. And then this, this new guy came in, Mubarak. And Mubarak lasted longer. And he did all the things that his predecessor did, Sadat. But he was 20 times, 100 times wiser and harsher because of what happened to his predecessor. Meaning, they, it seemed like we took a step forward, maybe even two or three steps. But we took at least 50 steps back. Now, it's easier for me in England to talk about that. I didn't face any difference. But you get the idea. Point being is, I just want this to understand that what's going on now in the Arab world it's really good, in one sense, on the one hand, that these shabby tyrants who have... I mean, if they were just taking people's money and, you know, lining their pockets, you think, oh, okay, well, you know, we can live with that. But, you know, these, some of them are just murderous. And they're not murdering one or two political opponents. They're just whatever. Okay? And so, no doubt at all, removing them, I mean, you think, it can't get worse than that. But the few... Uprisings that we have had, we can't put hand on heart to say, as of yet, maybe it'll all turn out fantastic. But actually, you don't know who is actually messing in Egypt. Is God Save the Queen Great Britain messing in Egypt? I wouldn't be surprised. For the sake of Islam? Unlikely. Is God is with us, United States of America, messing in Egypt? Very likely. For the sake of Islam? Unlikely. There are people who are sincere there. They just want, just give us some freedom, freedoms, at least freedom from tyranny. 
if not that at least the right to vote. So there are good aspirations, but there are, there's a mixture going on, and it's not clear to every scholar. So if you see a scholar hold back, that doesn't mean that that scholar is a government scholar or loves tyranny. It just means that it's not clear to him, because especially, uh, Sheikh Ahmed Sa'ad Sattos, especially when the leaders of the revolution, there is not one head, there are many heads. There are many agendas then. There are many agendas. You're not quite sure what's going on and who's going on. And the West have a beautiful history. And this country has... I mean, this, this country has got to have, if not the best, then one of the best histories of interfering in sovereign nations in a way that is so subtle but so destructive. We still fester from British, from British poking their nose in to the Middle East, Palestine, Israel. It was their mess. Now, politically, it seems like it's America's mess. Because that is the power base today. And Allah is... But all I'm trying to say is, we need to be more sharper in how we understand things. More aligned to Sharia. And Sharia is not sloganeering. We want Islam. We want Islam. La Sharia, La Gharabiyya, Islamiyya. Islam. Those are hollow statements. No Islam, no, no, no East, no West. Islam is the best. No, no, don't, don't go and say that. You know, go down to, you know, go down to Petticoat Lane and get yourself a printed T-shirt. But don't, don't say these things. Just live the reality. And if we can't live the reality nationally, live it in our house and let the light spread. That is not to say don't be concerned. But sometimes there are things that we can't do, but we want to do. And sometimes there are things that we can do, and we don't do. So at least let's be savvy. Dua must always be there. It's hard, uh, I'm not I'm not personal fatwa, so I'm not going to give up. But many of my teachers, they are at, they are logheads, in, not logheads in a bad way. They have different outlooks about just say the recent Arab Springs from Tunisia to Egypt uh, to Syria. Why? It's not because these people are blinded. Some of these are really deaf, uh, deaf scholars, really, mashallah. I mean, they they make me quite rightly, look like a child. But they differ because there are factors. One last hadith, inshallah. One last hadith. In Sahih Bukhari again. Ibn Abbas, radiallahu he said, I used, to I used to teach the Qur'an to some of the muhajirun, and amongst them was Abdurrahman ibn Auf. Whilst I was in his house at Mina in Mecca, and he was with Umar ibn al-Khattab during Umar's last and final hajj. Abdurrahman came in and said, he came to me and he said, Would that you had seen a man, if only you had seen the man who came to the Amir al-Mu'mineen, who came to the leader of the believers, the caliph today, Umar. And he said, O leader of the believers, what do you say about such and such and such and such a person? No, so, 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 sorry. Uh, if, if only that you had seen a man who came today to the leader of the believers, i.e. Umar, saying, O leader of the believers, what do you say about such and such a person who says, if Umar should die, I will give the oath of allegiance, the bay'ah, to such and such a person. For by Allah, the bay'ah, the oath of allegiance to Abu Bakr was nothing but a reaction which became a fact afterwards. And it shouldn't have happened. Uh, just in the heat of the thing. So this man in Hajj comes to Umar radiallahu, says these words. Abdurrahman ibn Auf is thinking, whoa, who is this man? One, to speak like that to Umar. And to secondly, go against something which there was a united agreement upon the caliphate of Abu Bakr radiallahu. Okay? There may have been different levels of acceptance, but there was an ultimate acceptance. And also Umar was there when it happened because he, you know, he had a hand in it. So Umar became angry at this man. And he said, if Allah wills, I will stand before the people tonight, because it's Hajj, Arafah, Khutbah, and all that business. If Allah wills, I will stand before the people tonight, and I will warn the people against those who desire to, de to deprive people of their rights, meaning the rights of rulership. So Abdurrahman ibn Awf, just one thing that you've got to know. Abdurrahman ibn Awf who was very much like Abu Bakr in character. If you think of Abu Bakr, you think of soft, 
small, humble, doesn't raise his voice. Whereas Khalid ibn al-Walid, for example, would be like Umar anhu, in stature and character. And the Prophet وسلم, would often pair up the likes of Umar, actually, literally, he paired Umar anhu, with, was it Khalid? No, no, with, with Abdurrahman ibn Awf, and Abu Bakr anhu, with Khalid. Because here is the softer, balance it with a little bit of a toughie. And here is a toughie, <laughs> balance it with a little bit of... Because the kamaliya is in the Prophet and the balanced perfection of toughness when it needs to be there, exactly in the amount it needs to be, gentleness when it needs to be, in exa- is with the Prophet in perfection. But the others, are, they get it right sometimes, most of the time, but not get it right. All. So they have this kind of thing. And that's really fiqh nafs as well. That's people looking at their own souls and seeing where they are. Okay, that's egos put out the window. Okay. So Omar says, I'm going to tell the people in the khutbah of Hajj. And Abdurrahman ibn Awf says, O oh, Amir al Mu'mineen, don't do this. For the season of Hajj gathers the Ra'a and the Khawha, the kind of common people and the, and the people who have got bad intentions. Okay. And it will be these people who will gather closest to you when you start to speak and address the people. And I fear that you will rise and address them, but some of them will spread your words without understanding them, and others will twist your words and take it out of context. Okay, because that's the masses. Okay, and uh, the masses don't understand, and that's the reality. Okay. If we had no religion, if we had no faith, no spiritual ambitions, no hereafter goal, no Allah Jalla wa ala, alhamdulillah, let, let public opinion rule in everything. But how can the public opinion rule in everything? How many people have studied Sharia here? Hands up. Studied serious Sharia, such that they're close to the levels of giving fatwa. So you see my point. How many, how can the lay people enter into religious affairs and they don't have Sharia knowledge? What the Prophet does teach us though, for example, after one battle, there were prisoners and uh, the Prophet for some reason wanted to free a particular prisoner or two. But he realized that war booty and other, peop- other tribes from the Muslims have got prisoners. And uh, so he couldn't just release them all because it would be depriving some people of the right. So he said, let's have a... Let's have this parliament, okay? And the way, best way to do that is, literally, the lords came, the tribal leaders came. And the Prophet said to them, look, go back to your tribe and say, look, I would like, I, the Prophet would like, as your leader, for releasing such and such prisoners and whatever, whatever, go back and see if your people are agreed with this, because I don't want to do it and then people get upset and say, oh, that was my right and whatever. So they go back to the leaders, literally the lords and the, and, the, and the serfs kind of thing, and they say, oh, this is what the Prophet wants to do. And then they get their answer from their tribes, they come back again, and the Prophet says, okay, what's that? Uh, and they all kind of, the majority, or they all said, yeah, it's fine, go ahead. So the Prophet did take into view public opinion, many a time. But in those administrative affairs that don't have a direct bearing on Sharia fatwas, so we need to understand where we're going. But anyway, so he says, that's what I'm going to do. But Abdurrahman says, the riffraff and the people who aren't going to understand you, I'm going to twist your words, they're going to be the nearest to you. And they're going to spread it. And once they spread it, khalas, it's like, you know, they got their Blackberry. <laughs> or, or because most of you aren't youths here, uh, you're, you're like iPhones or something like this, okay? Once it's, once it's on the net, okay, and depending on what it is, it's going to be viral. Okay, and once it's viral khalas, you can't really get it back. So then what is this? What does Abdurrahman say? And this is the point. I fear that your words will be taken out of context. So wait until you reach al Madina. Wait until you reach al Madina. SubhanAllah. And he says, wait until you reach al Madina, the land of migration or hijrah and the sunnah, the darul hijrah wa sunnah. Where you will be amongst the people of knowledge and understanding, and the noblest uh, of people. Bi ahli fiqhi wa ashraf nas. The people of understanding and nobility. And nobility doesn't mean they have blue blood or royal blood in them. Nobility means that these are people 
who have a temperament that is calm and calculated, give thought. They're not very impatient. They have that patience. They have that wisdom. That's ashrafun nas, means people like that. Not necessarily that they have blue blood or special blood running through them. Uh, it's their qualities uh, that they have. Uh, go to Dar al Hijra wa Sunnah, the land of Medina, the land of Hijra and Sunnah, where you'll be amongst the people of knowledge and understanding and the noblest of people. So there you may say what you have to say with confidence, since the people of knowledge will understand your words and put them in its proper context. So Umar said, Wallahi, by Allah, that is what I will do in my first address to the people of Medina. And he does that and he tells them the truth of how Abu Bakr became caliph and it spreads to the rest of the lands and we, it reaches us now through the narrations of Bukhari and others. Point being is, politics is a very delicate matter and there are always different agendas. Sometimes the agendas are just fickle. They're not evil, but they're fickle and they're, uh, they're, they're corrupting. As in, I don't intend to do Chinese whispers, but now that I've heard it, I've misunderstood it and said something that I shouldn't have said. That's not evil, that's just blundering. So politics can have that type of agenda, it can have evil agendas as well, and all the grades in between. And that's why the same Qur'an says in Surah An-Nisa, that when something comes, some news comes to you of public, public affairs, take it to the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and to those in authority who can investigate the matter thoroughly. Unless you start spreading abroad lies and misunderstandings and then khalas, you shake the community's foundation. All of these things tell us is that politics, in the sense, religiously and the popular sense, is a very deep thing. It has very different goals. It has, it has, it has different agendas. And the minimum is also a good scholar tends not to make a good politician. Understand this well. Leaving alone the caliphs, the four rightly guided caliphs, who in their time were also the four greatest scholars of fuqaha, or amongst the four greatest scholars of Umar, without doubt. It's just that Uthman and Ali in fiqh, there's a khilaf between who is afqa. And they say, uh, some say Uthman, and some say Ali. But generally, they were the four greatest scholars of their time, and they were the four caliphs. After that, it's a clear case of really scholar, rulers. Scholars advise rulers, keep them on their toes. Rulers try to get around scholars. Uh, and sometimes rulers keep the scholars on their toes. Okay? Oh, that's just such a theoretical load of nonsense. We ain't doing that, we're doing this. Okay? And it turns out to be the right thing. Scholars tend not to make good rulers. Why? Scholars work upon principle and integrity. Rulers have to work upon negotiation, pros and cons. Maybe sometimes giving with this hand and taking with that hand because of public interest and greater long-term goals. And scholars tend not to have the quality for that. Okay? Which is why in normative Sunni tradition, we don't look for scholars to being leaders, though in the minority uh, Imam Rafidi tradition, it's there. Precisely because the nature of, uh, of politics is that you have to groom yourself in a particular way. Not necessarily evil and dirty and dodgy, but you do have to know the art of compromise and negotiation. And scholars tend not to have that. All of this is for what? <coughs> to make us understand that there is a role for all of us. But I suggest rather than international politics, which minimum we should be there with du'as and concern, but practically we have to have local politics. How can you, you and you be concerned with some Muslims dying of some, some type of hardship over there in some far off Muslim land, when there are Muslims here who might be dying of hardships, or at least struggling. There are youths here on drugs. Sometimes they just get ensnared. And after all, didn't we send them to this school? And didn't we come to this? If you're first generation like my parents, didn't they choose to come to this country? So how can they just blame the youths when we threw our young children in the lion's den? At least let's let recognize it's a lion's den. And so, you know, when they get scarred a bit, we don't say, oh, how did you get blood on your shirt, you stupid boy? We say, oh, you know what? Happens when you're in a lion's den. Now we have to deal with it. And by that way, we will be a community who can help immediately where we are and we can help 
others outside. But we cannot be a community who merely gets our information from CNN, BBC, the newspapers or whatever, and make aspersions against Muslims and the scholars at that. Do you not know that one of the greatest ways that colonial powers like our country came into the Muslim world, one of the first things that they did, apart from divide and rule, was to weaken the authority of scholarly knowledge and scholarly institutions. If you can make people distrust their scholars, you can then shape and nurture their minds. And if you can't do it yourself, you can say, you know what, just go to the religious texts and understand them how you want. That would be destruction enough. And here we are, doubting our scholars. Okay? They're not all up to... They're not, unfortunately, all fit, fit for purpose. Most of us aren't fit for purpose, I suggest. Dua is needed. Patience. Don't let people rush us. Everything is urgent. Wallahi, everything is urgent. No haste. No haste. And youths, young people, slow down. Let your energies be uh, seasoned with the wisdom of the elders. Because there are some things you will just never know except that Allah will teach you it through time and experience. And when the energies of the youths and the wisdom of the elders comes together with sincerity to God, subhanAllah, then those who fear will fear and those who hope will hope. And people have just got to do the job. Jazakallah khair wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi Politics and the greater good. Any questions or comments? I have to say that anything that I've said, uh, it's my personal opinions and it's not the masjid's opinion, it's not the, uh, it's not the mosque's official opinion. Uh, so it can be differed with and you know, it could be wrong. <coughs> Any questions? I just have one question. Yes. Bismillah. Yes, Do you believe in democracy? Do I believe in this democracy? You sit down with him. <laughs> Muslim majority countries have an obligation that they be ruled by the teachings of Islam. Muslim minorities living in the West have no such obligation. And even if they didn't have that specific inspiration, I doubt if they will be sinful. <coughs> Firstly. Secondly, that democracy, which is, let's just say, in its basics, rule of people, by the people, for the people. <coughs> Some of the scholars, uh, Sheikh Ali Jumma, Mufti of Egypt, for example, comes to my mind, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya, speak about and people before have spoken about a type of democratization <coughs> that can be made to fit the Islamic and Sharia norms. In this, and so this is, a, this is work in progress and thought in progress, but at least let's hear the outlines of it so that we could join in the debate uh, intellectually. The Ameri American democracy is slightly different than the French democracy, which is slightly different than British democracy. But they're all democracies. On top of that, they're actually all liberal democracies. But clearly they are different. In this country, there is no written constitution. We are not a constitutional democracy, whereas France and the United States are constitutional democracies. That is to say, they have a text okay, with certain principles and statements on them which are foundational and you can't go against that. And the only way you can go against that is through some political process of consensus by correcting some things. But otherwise, it's the sacred text as far as they're concerned. Okay? Uh, in this country, we have uh, the law of judges, common law, history, and we have an unspoken constitution. Okay? Therefore, as people like Noah Feldman, a non-Muslim who's studied Islam and uh, religious policies of the Muslims, and also people like, uh, people like John Gray, one of the great philosophers and social critics of our time, 
even people like Roger Scruton, who's, a, who's one of the main philosophers of this country, will tell you that actually uh, democracy, forget about Islam, but democracy, okay, can have this idea that actually the people, okay, or will rule in government and will have checks and measures on their rule uh, on their leaders, and they can be a text, a constitution. Theoretically, therefore, you can see where more, some Muslim scholars are going. Make the constitution the Sharia. The Sharia has to be then, uh, you know, ijtihad has to be done with modern issues and whatever, whatever. But that's the basic thing. And then, as long as those clear-cut things aren't violated then a democracy can happen. Because what's the point of a democracy? At the moment, they say democracy, democracy is, the, uh, is the least worst of the forms of government. Plato, okay, in his Republic, going back you know, 3,000 years ago, uh, lists the styles of government, and he lists democracy as the second worst. And at the top, he lists uh, meritocracy, the rule of very wise, learned people. But you're talking about for a few hundred people. So you can manage that. But when you get to this size, it becomes difficult. So the point being is many, uh, many political theorists today will talk about democracy being the least worst of government. It has its real problems. But what it does allow to do, it allows the sentiments of the public to be expressed, which is sometimes a brilliant thing, which is sometimes a, a rubbish thing. Okay? Because we're all reading the Sun and the Daily Mirror and whatever, and that's our level of you know, of aspiration. And also what it does is it says, you know what? It's been four years now, or five years, depending upon the type of democracy, and we're going to change the ruler through elections. Because when you're there for a long time in ruler, things can go wrong and tyranny can happen. So democracy comes along to begin to, how can I restrict the power of government? That's why democracy comes along. Liberal democracy comes along because how can I not only restrict the power of government, but how can different people with different religious beliefs, Protestants, Catholics, and Jews, live together under one political structure without killing each other in a war? Separate church and religion. Okay, ch uh, uh, state and religion. So the point being is, uh, so there are conceptually ways that it can happen. So... Because democracy isn't a Sharia word, if someone says, if you were to hear someone say, oh, I believe in democracy, they can mean one of two things. Either they believe that Muslims in Muslim majority countries can legislate against Quran because the will of the people is sovereign. In that case, that's kufr. That's a disbelief. Whoever doesn't judge by what God has revealed is no more than an unbeliever. But if democracy is that, at the core, we have sacred law, and then everything else is shaped around that, then it wouldn't be kufr. It would be something very useful, because the Muslim world, the, the Middle Eastern part of it, and the East Asian part, sub, sub, subcontinent part of it, Pakistan being a prime example, has only known political tyranny. Okay? Um, that's with Pakistan being a democracy as well. Um, so it really needs, and, you know, and the reality is people just need to be allowed, uh, left to live their lives without political interference of that level. Okay? So it's work in progress, and we need to be careful what we mean, what we reject or accept by democracy. If someone says democracy is all haram, then they may not always be right, unless they mean it in the first sense. And if someone says democracy, you can have Islamic democracy, they may not be wrong, especially if they mean it in the second sense. And that is why we need to look at the reality of structures, not their names. We're not really looking at democracy, we're looking at what does democracy mean and do? What does democracy mean and do? Okay? Yes, the rule of the people, by the people, for the people. Or in this case, we have representative democracies, we vote people into parliament and they act on our behalf. And that's a good thing if the will of the people, because the Prophet took into consideration in the small city-state of Medina, he was going to the common people. And he was asking, and they could come and approach him. Okay? And when, the, when common people get really angry or upset about taxes, about, about health service, it, you know, it can be an explosive thing. And so government are, you know, government are public servants, and we need the Muslim countries to have that kind of thing. And you can trace some of these concepts back 
to even the actions of the Prophet Sallallahu but I'm not saying that Islam invented democracy. We don't have to go to that thing. We can, we're happy to borrow good ideas, just like we borrowed the Persian idea of a trench around Medina in war, and then we gave it a French, uh, that Persian name, Khandaq, which wasn't Arabic according to, you know, uh, Sheikh, what Sheikh Ahmed was saying. Yesterday. And we borrowed this, and we borrowed that, and we went into the uh, Umayyad Caliphate, and the Umayyad Caliphate went to Persia, which had a big civilization, bigger than the Arabs, obviously, and then they just borrowed everything from the Persian, and Persian bureaucracy, literacy, and style, and whatever, and they just Islamicized some things. Alhamdulillah, we've been borrowing... Mashallah, we've been borrowing from day one because we believe we are not arrogant enough to not be an accumulative civilization, meaning take the best from wherever it comes, but at least let's think about what is best. Allah knows best, and answer for democracy, and Allah knows best. Democratically, I think 9.30 is passed, inshallah. <laughs> Democratically, we will begin to close close shop inshallah. Jazakallah khair subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanallah wa bihamdihi Jazakallah khair for your patience. Mashallah. Haven't done it. Talk about it for a long time. You certainly don't have the will of the people behind you. I don't know. Mr. Jizli or otherwise. But my wife, you'll have to at least sympathize with my wife.